Greetings from Witch Chapel United Methodist Church, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. We invite you to worship with us. Our Sunday worship times are 8 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 10.10 a.m., and 11.15 a.m. We're located off Highway 291 between Woods Chapel Road and Lakewood Boulevard in Lee Summit, Missouri. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at 816-795-8848, extension 321. We hope you find this message meaningful and relevant in your daily life. Today is uh, part five in a sermon series on giving thanks. And what that means is at the end of the sermon today, we won't be thankful anymore till next November. <laughs> Actually, I hope nothing is further than the truth. I hope that over the last few weeks and today as we lift up the concept of being thankful and grateful to God for who he is, that you can just feel that come in and change your life. As I was, uh, actually you'll notice in the bulletin there's no scripture listed, that's because um, the staff was gone Thursday and Friday, so they wanted my bulletin stuff on Monday, and I, I, didn't, know what, I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't real worried about it, though, because there's always something to be grateful for, isn't there? So I said, well, just run it. We'll do something. I ended up in the story of Jonah. And all of you know the story of Jonah. If you don't, uh, Jonah is Jonah's one of God's guys. And uh, God asked Jonah to go uh, preach to the Ninevites. And he doesn't like the Ninevites. Maybe it'd be like a MU fan being asked to go to Lawrence and preach the good news or vice versa. But he doesn't want to do that and so he runs away, he gets on a ship and they throw him overboard and because a big storm comes up and Jonah's swallowed by a fish and uh, he's in the belly of the fish for three days and then he has a prayer which we're going to read in a minute. After the prayer... Uh, he gets a second chance. And I don't know about you, but my only prayer in that fish would be, God, I'd like another chance at this deal. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches to the people. They're converted. And then Jonah's mad about it and sulks. So that's the story of Jonah. Let's stand for our scripture lesson. Jonah chapter 2. This is Jonah's prayer. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas. The currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters engulfing me threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you in your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Wow, I got stuck there. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit 
to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. There is a lot to be thankful for in that story, especially if you're Jonah. I want to start with my normal disclaimer anytime we talk about Jonah. I have no need at all to explain this story away. None. Can you be swallowed by a fish? Just because it hasn't happened to you doesn't mean it might not. There's a lot of strange things that happen to people. You ever seen Ripley's Believe It or Not? This is the way I look at this. If God can make this amazing world, if a sequoia redwood tree starts as a little bitty, tiny thing, if God has the imagination for giraffes and zebras, and the myriads of fish in the sea, then who am I to say Jonah couldn't be swallowed by a great fish? You know, in my crazy brain, I, I even can imagine a, a, a fish that had a big air bubble. You know, it's down in there and I guess you'd be praying on the way in. I hope this fish has an air bubble. And would that be good air to breathe? No, I don't think so. But if it was all you had, I think you'd breathe that. So I don't think we should be in the business of needing to explain that stuff away. Because God does amazing, incredible things. My trouble with the story, as you know, is that it took him three days before he prayed. I don't know about you, but I'm praying before I even get in the mouth of the fish. You know, I'm in the water and I'm treading water and I see this kind of squiggle thing over there, you know, like, uh uh-oh, something's over there and it's big. I'm praying right then. I'm sorry, I changed my mind. (laughs) You know, whatever you want, I'll go do it. Uh, How about uh, I just sort of grab onto the fin like we do at SeaWorld and that dolphin, that's not a dolphin, is it? Maybe it just pulls me to shore. I mean, I'd be praying right there. I wouldn't be waiting three, three days. Okay, there are a lot of things to be thankful for in this story. Uh, the first thing I want you to see in this story that all of us should be thankful for is that God doesn't act us to be, ask us to be perfect, just willing Look at Jonah. He's one of God's guys. He is high enough, esteemed highly enough in in, in the mind of God that God chooses him for a mission. We've always thought, I did, I always thought of Jonah as kind of a loser. But Jonah is on God's radar screen. Jonah has some sense of faithfulness in his life, enough so that God chooses him. That's the first thing he does. Then the next thing we see is him running away. Then we celebrate the change of heart in the belly of the fish. He preaches to the Ninevites. Then he complains and grouses because they were converted. And I see the human cycle, faithful, faithless, belief, doubt, trust, then resistance. Can you relate to this? I can relate to this. I am good. I am bad. I am on. I am off. I am solid. I am a a mess. The whole thing that the Apostle Paul talked about, the spirit warring with the flesh, those two forces inside of our heart that we struggle with, you can see it in the life of, of Jonah. And I think we have to give thanks that God uses broken people. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. He just wants you to be willing. Something else I want us to celebrate here is a change of heart.
however faithful he was before all of this happened to him, I'm telling you what, when that fish spit him out, he had a change of heart. And I'm so thankful that God keeps working with us. My heart is better than it was 10 years ago, than it was 10 years before that and 10 years before that. If we're open and thinking and looking and focusing on what is important, what is really important, God continues to do his amazing work in our lives. Since I believe that the Christian faith must be lived every day, I want to talk for a couple of minutes about what I saw on TV yesterday. Back and forth, the score went in the game. Back and forth. And you know what I saw in the fans? Joy. Despair. Did you, did you see the girl with the hood? I'm thinking, somebody recorded this that knows her. And then a few minutes later, it's despair and joy. Then joy and despair. And, and these are hard lessons to learn. My son is driving home with his mom today after witnessing Blue Spring South lose the state championship game. Let's not be confused about what our life is about. Let's not be confused about what's really important. Let's not wound one another over that which is peripheral. A few years ago I talked about this and I said, you know, uh, at at time of death, no one one puts uh, school insignias on their casket. And someone sent me a website. (laughs) When I think about the change of heart that God does within us, please remember and celebrate with me that at the end of the day when we throw off whatever colors we're wearing, down underneath is the sign of the cross the seal of the Holy Spirit that makes us all together, all on the same team. The things that divide people out in the world, Christians should not be divided by. We have a hope. We have a joy. We have something that makes us complete. God changes our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Something else I'm thankful for in Jonah's prayer is that it is not primarily about deliverance. As this prayer is set in the story, he doesn't even know if he's going to get out of the fish. There is no bargaining. There are no deals being cut. God, okay, give me another chance, just get me out of the fish. That's not in the prayer. And how shallow are our relationships if they are conditional? I will love you as long as you keep getting me tickets to the Royals games. I will love you as as long as you keep buying my dinner. I will care about you as, as long as you keep being there to give me advice when I need it. God, I will love you as long as you keep me healthy, wealthy, and whatever else. What does that say about our relationships when they are conditional? When they are tied to an outcome that is pleasing to us? Oh, for friendships that just say, Dennis, no matter what, we're bonded. I love you forever. Kathy Brinkman. Driving home from St. Louis, whatever mile marker you're at, you're awesome. I I love you. God, 
I don't even know if I'm going to get out of the belly of this fish. But, but this moment has caused me to just celebrate who you are. Listen to this stuff. I said I've been banished from your sight, but I will look again toward your holy temple. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. That's pretty low. But you brought my life up from the pit. My life was ebbing away, but I remembered you, Lord. My prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. With a song of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. Salvation comes to the Lord. And the Lord had the fish spit him out. Now, I don't know what the Lord was thinking. And I hate to presume to think on behalf of God. That's very dangerous. But here is my child in the belly of this fish. He's not even asking to get out. He's just thanking me for the goodness. He's just celebrating with me all that there is. Oh, I've got to save him. Oh, I've got to give him another chance. Fish, turn him loose. God must be so pleased when we love him just for sake of loving him. power of being thankful, the power of being grateful, is an absolutely amazing thing. And I hope these five weeks have flavored your life just a little bit with thoughts of what a grateful heart can do for you. Henry Nouwen and other writers talk about the power of gratefulness. And why Thanksgiving is so wonderful. Christmas, you know, it's, we fight commercialism. At Easter time, we fight the bunny and new clothes. But at Thanksgiving, a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of joy, a spirit of grace just sort of pervades our hearts and we become full. It's clean, it's clear, it's crisp. I asked you all five weeks ago to make a list in November of 30 things you were thankful for. Do you remember that? I'm not going to ask you if you did it. I just want to know if you remember. Raise your hand if you remember. Okay, it's not too late. What's today? November 30th. Well, it's my last chance. I finished my list today. You know, it was so easy. It was so easy. I just woke up in the morning and I said, what am I thankful for today? And I've been thinking, tomorrow, tomorrow, December 1st, I'd like to sit down and write. And I'd like to say, here are the 30 things from November. And just to see if I could do it, I want to see if tomorrow I can think of 30 things, more things, a second 30 things that aren't on this list. And you know, this morning, I already got them, 30 different things. And I thought, I wonder if I could come up with another 30 things. I started writing them down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 68 things. You know, if every day you get up and think of one or two or three things to be grateful for. The whole day begins to change. That is one of the things that I have absolutely loved about these last 30 days. I forced myself, even on days when something was going on that I didn't like, imagine that. You know, uh, some child was driving me crazy or whatever it was. Just the exercise of, of saying, I will give thanks for something, turned a corner in my heart. And friends, nothing is more attractive in another person than a spirit of gratefulness. 
Nothing will draw your family together. Nothing will have your friends want to hang around you more than a spirit of joy and, and gratefulness that just is coming out of you. I love the picture in this story. of two needy people. Jonah, servant of God, and someone in Nineveh. And I love how God will will bring people into your path that you can help. That when you start the day with a spirit of joy and a hopeful outlook, that God will bring people to you that you can care about. A generous heart can overcome its humanness and go out to a person in need. And there is nothing more awesome than to help another person. So I like ringing the bell for the Salvation Army. It doesn't benefit the church. And I like to say it doesn't benefit me personally but it does benefit my heart. And I get to witness the generosity of people. And you know, it, it, it's a buck. It's, it's not about money. It's about a generous heart. A couple of quarters. Uh, watching people teaching their children about helping others. I celebrate in this story. I'm thankful for the way that God calls us to reach out and care for one another, I wish I was better at it. I wish we were better at it. Not everyone uh, has, has a generous heart. Not all hearts go out to others. Sometimes we get self-consumed. And so I got stuck on verse 8. Did you hear verse 8? How many times have I read the story of Jonah in my life? A lot. A lot. Verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And I'm suddenly thinking of everything in my life that I have loved too much. Everything that got too much of me. Because in throwing myself at those things, I was robbing myself of the grace that God had intended. The pastor told a story about a young man named Johnny. He and his wife were enthusiastic participants in the congregation, but then the weeds of worldly care choked out their young faith. They got busy. They got children. They became wealthy. Their lives filled up with boats and cars and house building and social engagements. They were in worship less and less frequently then, not at all. After a two-year absence on a bright winter Sunday, the preacher said, I saw Johnny. I said, Johnny! So good to see you. What brought you to worship today? He said, I woke up this morning feeling so good, so blessed, so alive, so created. I just had to say thank you. And this is the only place I could think of to say it adequately. You know, I love this thing about the Christian faith. I I love this thing that happens to us when God gets a hold of us, you know, We may get lost out there in worthless idols, but the Holy Spirit keeps drawing us back. The Holy Spirit keeps calling us back to a place of faithfulness. And I'm so happy and excited for those times in my life when I see things for what they really are and I say, you know what? That stuff is robbing me of the grace that God had otherwise intended. Someone wrote, I am the most 
I am most fully alive when I am reaching out to help another. And you know, when I am grateful, when I am thankful for who God is and what he's done, I just want to look for somebody to care about. It's, it's, it's a wonderful natural phenomenon that I think happens in the, in the heart of a Christian. When you're full, you just want some of it to spill over. I received an email this week. You probably received it too. I think I've received it 20 times this year. Uh, it is the Charles Schultz philosophy of life. The first thing I did when I got it and thought, yeah, there's a point there. I went out on the internet and found, yes, it is not the philosophy of Charles Schultz. Charles Schultz Museum uh, declines that he wrote this. However, uh, you know the story and let's, let's make the point. Name the five wealthiest people in the world. Name the last five Heisman Trophy winners. Name the last five Miss Americas. Name ten people who have won the Nobel Prize. Name the last ten years of World Series winners. How did you do? What's the problem with that? What the world calls important and what our hearts know is important is two completely different things. The quiz goes on. List a few teachers who aided your journey during school. Miss McCoy, Miss Humo, Mrs. Schwartz, Coach Buck, Bob Tuttle, Ed Wimberly. Name three friends who have helped you through a difficult time. Name five people who have taught you something worthwhile. Name a few people who made you feel appreciated. Think of five people you enjoy spending time with. So what's the difference? The people that we remember are the ones who cared about us. They are the people who made an investment in our lives. And that is the whole point of God calling Jonah. He wants Jonah to make an investment in the lives of these other people. And in the midst of Jonah's unhappiness, God continues to get his work done. One of the greatest things you can do, one of the most joyful things that you can do is to make an investment in the life of another person. And when your heart is full of gratitude, it just starts to happen. You see people that you want to share the joy with. G.K. Chesterton was a writer, now deceased. He said... You say grace before meals. Okay. He said, I say grace before the movie and before the evening news. I say grace before a concert and a sporting event. I say grace before I open a book. I say grace before sketching, painting, working, swimming, Fencing, walking, playing, dancing. I say grace before I dip the ink in the pen. I am completely, comprehensively overwhelmed with gratitude for life itself. And so I invite you today and forever, the imperfect ones that we are, to make an investment in the lives of those around you and to be comprehensively, completely, unreservedly, in spite of circumstances, grateful to our most loving Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the power of a grateful heart. Thank you for the joy of knowing you. 
It helps us see things so much more clearly. Thank you for the chance to be about your work. Let a spirit of thanksgiving carry on through December, on into every day that you give us in this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.